Evening, sir. We have done nearly 190 webinars since we started it, and we have been very fortunate that we have had a blend of foreign scholars and Indian scholars, the very best that we could request and invite. In that very context, we have had two Nobel laureates come and speak to us on these webinar series. A few more, and we are expecting from Harvard the recent Nobel laureate to come and speak to us in February on uh, gender related issues. Within the country, we have had the best policymakers that have also spoken to us. The focus has been on research based policy advice through these webinars, and we have been tackling many, many contemporary issues, both relevant to India as well as global economics. We are also fortunate during the G20 for Task Force 5. We did 11 webinars, wherein again we had a blend of foreign speakers and Indian researchers. Right now, we are in the midst of doing another one under the G20, ages of G20, which is women empowerment. We have already done nine and three are in the pipeline. We have been very fortunate to have the best minds coming to us and sharing their books, research articles, or research, and thereby till middle of February, all Friday webinar slots are totally full. Today's webinar is on a very important topic, multidimensional poverty. Niti Ayog had released his book recently. To discuss this, we have invited Dr. Yogesh Suri, who is in a way the author of that research. To chair the webinar, we have Dr. Arvind Virmani, who's a member of Niti Ayog, and I'm going to introduce all the members in a minute. To discuss this report, important report, which Niti Ayog has released, we have Dr. Pradab Singh and Dr. Amitabh Kundu. To introduce the panel today and the chairperson, let me take a minute. Dr. Arvind Virmani, as I mentioned, is a member of Niti Ayog. He has been a mentor earlier to FIKI and member of RBA Technical Advisory Committee on Monetary Policy. He was also the chairman of Foundation for Economic Growth and Welfare, the founding chairman. Before that, he was executive director IMF and chief economic advisor of our country. He was also the principal advisor planning commission earlier. During his tenure, he has advised on a host of economic policy reforms through hundreds of policy papers, notes, and participation in committees. He has served as member Telecom Regulatory Authority of India and as director and chief executive of the Indian Council for Research on International Economic Relations. He has published 35 journal articles and 20 book chapters and written over 50 other working papers in the area of macroeconomics, growth, finance, tax reforms, international trade and tariffs, international relations and national security strategy. He has contributed extensively in policy making at every level in our country. Dr. Yogesh Suri, chief speaker today, is a development economist and a policy analyst. He is currently a senior advisor at Niti Aayog in the rank of additional secretary to government of India, where he is in charge of governance research, state finance, and coordination verticals. He is holding additional charge as Director General of National Institute of Labor Economic Research and Development. Dr. Suri has diverse experience of over 28 years, ranging from planning and development, food security, consumer affairs, fertilizers and chemicals, macroeconomic research to empowering small and medium enterprises, banking, financial markets, risk management, etc. He is an alumnus of Department of Business Economics and Hindu College, University of Delhi. He holds a PhD from the University of Rajasthan. Our first discussant today is Dr. Pranab Sain. Dr. Pranab Sain is a former country director for the India Program of International, International Growth Center. Pranab, Dr. Pranab received his PhD in economics from the Johns Hopkins University 
specializing in open economy macroeconomic systems, international economics, and public finance. He was the chairman of the National Statistical Commission. He also had positions as principal economic advisor, government of India's planning commission, the first chief statistician of our country, acting as the functional and technical head of the national statistical system in India, as well as secretary ministry of statistics and program implementation, government of India from 2007 to 2010. As a representative of the planning commission, he was principal author and coordinator of the midterm appraisal of the eight five-year plan, the ninth five-year plan, the midterm appraisal of the ninth year plan, tenth five-year plan, and the midterm appraisal of the tenth five-year plan. Dr. Amitabh Kundu, our next discussant for the day, is a senior fellow with the Sustainable Cities and Transport Program. Dr. Kundu has been a distinguished fellow at Research and Information System for Developing Countries. He was professor and dean of the School of Social Sciences at GNU, a member of National Statistical Commission, and chaired the post Sachar Evaluation Committee that, and that for estimating her urban housing shortage. He was reading at UNESC WA Beirut and consultant to Sri Lankan government on population census. Currently, he is chairing a committee to monitor the national survey being conducted for Swachh Bharat mission for the Ministry of Drinking Water and Sanitation. He was visiting professor at the University of Amsterdam and University of Warburg. He was director at various institutes in India and he is in the editorial board of a large number of national and international journals. He has about 25 books and 200 research articles published in India and abroad to his credit. With this, I hand over the session to the chair, chairperson for the day, Dr. Arvind Virmani, please. Thank you, Charan. Uh so before I call Dr. Sudhi to make his presentation, I'll just give a very brief kind of uh, overview in terms of locating the multidimensional poverty. So uh, for, for uh, especially for your younger audiences who may not be that familiar. So, uh, you know, the, the traditional uh, concept of uh, poverty uh, is there for, uh, you know, since the 1950s, uh, is based on uh, use of income or consumption. Uh, so uh, this is grounded in conventional economic theory, which, which shows that if, uh, if people have the income, they will decide what to spend it on. So the old uh, concepts have uh, existed for, for, for a long time and were used. Uh, one of the things which came uh, in that was that the GDP mean, the the, the consumption or the income coming out of the GDP uh, was very different from the survey means which were used to get an income uh, survey or a consumption survey. So uh, in the old days, uh, they used to take the average and multiply all the survey data with the difference between the GDP. So in some sense, the GDP estimates were taken as more accurate in absolute value and therefore divided by the population in terms of per capita income of consumption. Now this stopped somewhere around uh, 2000 and early 2000, maybe if my memory is correct, around 2005, six, it was decided that is not the proper way to see, uh, you know, look at the distribution, which was quite correct, but it was also decided by the World Bank at that time that the uh, cutoff point also, uh, it was not appropriate to use the GDP for the cutoff point, which is what a poverty is. Poverty is anybody with an income of consumption uh, below some defined level. So uh, this, this multiplication stop being uh, done. And uh, what we know is that the gap has increased for a long time in India, it became bigger and bigger, and then it has plateaued off. So th that is uh, one of the issues which often comes up uh, in, in discussions. Uh, the, the second, a thing which was very uh, uh, India specific was uh, that uh, these consumption surveys used to have hundreds of questions, you know, on, on food consumption, beverage consumption, uh, clothes consumption, uh, and uh, 
semi uh, durable consumption so uh, uh, again around uh, uh, around this period uh, uh, sorry that 2005 6 is for this issue not the other issue which i mentioned uh, was uh, uh, under uh, me only i raised this issue that uh, the uh, issue was that how can you uh, so the, the, the issue was that everything the question was what have you purchased in the last 30 days uh, whether it was food beverages uh, whether it was clothes whether it was uh, you know uh, a cycle uh, or uh, or an air conditioner or, or a tv set let's say so uh, uh, it was felt that uh, this was not appropriate and and then uh, i while I was there, of course, I left in 2006 and went on to become the CEA. At that time, this was put into the hopper and uh, the conclusion was rightly reached that uh, we need different uh, periods for the different categories of work. So things you produce uh, frequently, like food, every, many poor people produce almost every day or every two days, that would have a 30-day recall period, a longer or a seven-day recall period, and for other things like toothpaste, etc., which you might buy, uh, you know, once a month or several months, uh, and so on. So this uh, and a whole year for the very long acting ones. So, uh, so at some point after I left, the decision was taken in the planning commission, and from the 2011-12 uh, survey, uh, the planning commission, which was the <clears throat> uh, commission charged for making these uh, poverty estimates, switched over. To, to the mixed uh, recall period. And since that time, uh, this has been an accepted fact, except uh, it's important to mention that the World Bank did not switch over. Uh, so uh, they, they are still using the uh, uniform recall period, which is wrong, which uh, everybody has agreed. There's lots of data research on this that is wrong, but they continue to, uh, to use it. And uh, that, rate, that gives a much higher uh, poverty rate uh, uh, then we get if we use the proper uh, mixed recall period uh, as I mentioned. So th this is an issue which comes up. Uh, so uh, the, the fourth thing is what got us to the uh, multidimensional index. You know, the, at, at some point in the past 20 years, uh, the uh, human development index came into the picture. Uh, the UN developed this index and so on. And uh, people felt that uh, just looking at uh, income or consumption didn't give a uh, full picture. Now, in, in economic terms, uh, there is a distinction between private goods and what could be called public goods and quasi-public goods. So, uh, there is absolutely zero doubt that for uh, pure private goods, the consumption and investment indicate, uh, income indicator is the correct one. Uh, but uh, I think questions were rightly raised that the distribution of public goods also affects Poverty, and therefore, uh, after discussion and all this multi uh, uh, MDI, the, the, the dimension, multi-dimensional index, kind of uh, took shape. Of course, there are uh, others who will our discussions may want to uh, put on this, but I just wanted to give an overview, and that is the uh, what the current talk is going to be. So, before I hand it over to uh, Dr. Suri, uh, I just want to mention that according to uh, our estimate of poverty, which we published in IMF, me and Palla and others, uh, the, uh, the the absolute poverty, of course, was virtually eliminated. But the uh, middle, uh, what I, I prefer to call the low middle income indicator, uh, which used to be 2.1, uh, 3.2 uh, dollar per day of the World Bank, uh, gave a poverty rate of approximately 18%. And the MDI index, which Dr. Suri is going to get into more detail about, was 15%. So, in effect, actually, the MDI indicator is very close uh, to the uh, to, to the uh, lower mil middle income uh, poverty indicator. So, th that's kind of the broad level. Of course, there's a lot more detail, which uh, is very, very important for many other uh, purposes, not just the aggregate number. And that is what uh, Dr. Suri is going to uh, talk to us about. So over to you, Dr. Suri. Uh, Honorable Member uh, Barmani ji, uh, Charan ji, 
Vishal Das and uh, Mr. Kondu and uh, my former boss, uh, Dr. Pranav Sen, but I can't see him. Uh, it's a, I hope I'm audible. Yeah, so it's a great pleasure to be present in this uh, webinar today. So Pancharanji has been requesting me for quite some time. And um, so finally, I think today I got this opportunity. I'm thankful to the entire team of Figaro Foundation and, uh, and our, of course, our member who has uh, very kindly chaired this session. So, so I'll make a brief presentation of basically this multi-dimensional poverty index. Uh, Honorable member has already given a broad overview. And um, as I think many of us have antecedents in the planning commission. So when I also joined planning commission in 2010, all we were talking about is this earlier Lakhlawala committee, and then we were having Tendulkar committee at that point of time. And planning commission used to come out with the official poverty estimates. But after 2011, of course, we have not been breaking it out and for various reasons. And uh, and and this global multi-dimensional poverty index also a report which has started coming out around the same time. I think 2010-11, uh, I think the first report had come, and uh, the latest earlier report was also released sometime in the month of uh, I think June of uh, 2023. And immediately after that, we also came out with our national multi-dimensional poverty index report. So I'll, I'll make a brief presentation on that. So next. So I think there's some technical age we're trying to move the slide further. Yeah. So uh, sir has already given a broad indicator of a uh, uh, broad idea of what MPI is all about. Uh, actually, sir, we have this, uh, this uh, global target uh, under sustainable development goals, goal number 1.2, target number 1.2, which is basically to end poverty in all forms. And uh, multi-dimensional poverty index is one of the important indicators of poverty. And of course, uh, this is, I, I can, the, 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 the outside I can say it's complementing monetary poverty studies. So it is not intending to replace the monetary poverty calculation either in the country or at the world level. So it, it is an additional measure which gives some more idea about the poverty levels in the country. So it's basically this MPA is tries to capture what is the deprivation because everything is not in the hands of the People, because when when we talk about monetary poverty, we look at the how much money is in the hands of the people, how much expenditure they have been making. Of course, the income we can't calculate, so we go by expenditure level. But everything is not in the hands of the people. Just money is not enough because whether they have access to drinking water, whether they have access to proper sanitation facilities, there's something which have to be done by the government, and which are equally important indicators of the quality of life of the people. And that's what uh, uh, the MPI tries to uh, capture. And uh, and when we look at over a period of time, of course, it can track how poverty is going up and down, and it can help in allocating uh, allocation of resources based on the MPI levels in various uh, states and the districts. In fact, I can uh, I'm very proud to mention that unlike uh, planning commission's original poverty estimates, which used to bring out uh, poverty levels at the rural and uh, in the rural and urban areas at the state level, MPI tries to capture at the district level. So it goes much beyond only uh, simply this poverty at the uh, at the state level. So based on poverty, we can look at the reforms of the various areas, reforms in the various uh, sectors. It helps in uh, policy coordination. So, and um, I mean, of course, the idea is to identify, ultimately identify the poorest so that no one is uh, left behind. Next slide. So I'll just give a broad uh, snapshot of the global MPI. So this report came out earlier in the middle of this year. Uh, so this, uh, Globally, as for the global MPI report and uh, our Indian report by and large uh, also has similar statistics, but we have searched, brought out this report only two, two issues have come so far. So as for the global multidimensional poverty index report, which is brought out by Oxford Poverty and uh, Research, OPHI, Oxford Policy and Human Development Initiatives, along with UNDP. And uh, as per that report in 2005, since India's poverty was about 55%, which is came, which came down to about 27.7% uh, in 2015, 16. And about 16.4% uh, 2019-21. Here I would like to mention that this calculation of MPA is based on NFHS survey, and globally also the same methodology is used. India's methodology exactly follows the global methodology, only with the difference that in the global methodology we have 10 indicators, and in India's methodology we have 12 indicators. So as per the global report, uh, this uh, that is trying to track out how many people have exited the poverty. As per the latest report, about 415 million people have. Uh, exited uh, multidimensional poverty in India between 2005-06 and 2019-21. So I use the word 2019-21 actually because the survey period of uh, 
and FHS 5 was 2019 to 21 because that COVID period got little extended. Next slide, please. Sir. So this national multinational poverty index, we bring out this report again in collaboration with the OPHI and the UNDP. So uh, and I'm sure many of you are aware, but there is a uh, there is an exercise which is going on in Niti Aayog, uh, which is at, as per the directions of the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we try to capture about 28 different global indices and then try to see how India is performing among those indices. So many times what is happening is the global indices are launched and they, in many of the cases, they show India in a very poor light. And then here in this exercise, we try to dig deeper into how those indices are being calculated, what kind of data is being used by them. And then whether we are able, whether we can provide them a more accurate data and whether their methodology is fine or not. So that's uh, so cabinet secretary has mandated uh, Niti Aayog to look into those indices and uh, national multidimensional poverty index is one of the 28 indicators and this N uh, MPI is primarily is uh, Niti Aayog's baby. So and uh, as I said, as for SDG commitment, we had to uh, bring down this global uh, national poverty index uh, uh, poverty headcount ratio by about 50 percent between 2015-16. And 2029-30. So we have to halve the poverty in India. So, uh, so I'll come to India statistics. So we have already uh, achieved a substantial part of that. So uh, Niti Aayog is the mandated nodal ministry for uh, MPI, and uh, so the idea is to come out with this uh, figure and try to uh, rank the states and also come out with the figures at the uh, state level as well as the district level, and also identify various reform areas which we can undertake based on these uh, data. Next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, so the, when we started the exercise, we tried to look at, but we also took the solicited feedback of all the concerned ministries, because when these 12 indicators are there, so all indicators are uh, primarily uh, the data is being collected by different ministries and including Minister Statistics. So we set up this uh, MPI coordination committee where we had uh, representatives of all those ministries and there we deliberated with the methodology, which is primarily in line with the global methodology and all these ministries are on board. And we, they also help us to provide the data in respect of all these 12 indicators. Next. So I'll come to this now, National MPI methodology. Next. So as I was saying, the global methodology had 10 indicators. India's National MPI has 12 indicators. And these 12 indicators are broadly divided into three baskets. You can say one basket is health, which has three indicators. Second basket is education, which has uh, again, again, three indicators or uh, two indicators. And the third basket is standard of living in which there are seven indicators. And so weightages you can see here, like uh, this is health. So we have these three indicators, nutrition, child and adolescent mortality and maternal health. Education, we have years of schooling and school attendance. And the standard of living, we have cooking fuel, sanitation, drinking water, housing, electricity, asset ownership, and the banking accounts. So these two indicators, the serial number three, maternal health, and the last indicator, bank accounts. These are the two additional indicators which uh, uh, Governor of India has taken, uh, in addition to 10 indicators, which are exactly in line with the uh, global methodology. So I may also add this, uh, the globally, the methodology for every country, they look at the demographic and health service. And uh, based on that, they try to calculate uh, the poverty levels in different countries. Corresponding that same survey of India is the National Family Health Survey. And uh, for uh, India, that's how we use this NFHS data. So the first report which we brought out was based on NFHS 4 data, for, that is 2015-16. Uh, and the latest report which we have brought out just two months back, that is based on the NFHS 5 data, that is for 2019-21. Next. So but briefly, as to how we calculate the MPI is actually the, the, this requires the actually looking into dig, deep dive into the data at the household level. Uh, first, we try to build a deprivation profile for each household, for each of the 12 indicators, how deprived are the people, whether they have access to clean water, they have access to schooling, and all, the, all those 12 indicators. There's detailed definition is also there. If, if anyone is interested, I can share that uh, at a later stage. Then for each of the household, once we have this deprivation profile for all the 12 parameters, then we try to see whether in more than 33% of the uh, in the more 30% of the indicators are they multi are they poor? If their score is more than 33%, then they are that household is termed as a multi-dimensional poor. And one major advantage of this MPI is compared to uh, traditional monetary uh, poverty statuses is that 
it not only tells how many people are poor, but it also tells how poor are the poor. It also tries to calculate the intensity of poverty. And then uh, there is a comprehensive score uh, in which uh, uh, we multiply this headcount ratio with the intensity of poverty to work out the MPI score. Mm -hmm. Next. Mm -hmm. So I'll now briefly give this broad findings of the latest report. Uh, so, so as Sarah also also indicated uh, in the uh, in the latest report, the earlier uh, the report which was brought over 2015-16, the poverty in India was about 24.85 percent based on NFHS four, and uh, based on NFHS five, this poverty has come down to 14.96 percent. So you can see from about 25 to 15, almost a 10 percentage point reduction. Uh, which translates into about uh, 13 and a half crore people who have uh, escaped this multidimensional poverty. And all 12 indicators, of, uh, as I said, it's MPI is a basically a combination of 12 indicators. Every indicator has shown improvement. I'll show a slide on that also, how much improvement is there in each of the categories. And uh, so SDG 1.2 target is to halve the multidimensional poverty. And from 25 to 15, we have come in just five, six year period. And today, um, we are sure if in 2023, a survey is done, of course, NFHS 6 now they are starting. So perhaps by now we would have already achieved this uh, halving of the target of uh, uh, poverty. Uh, another very uh, significant feature of our latest report is that uh, we have found this poverty reduction in the rural areas is very uh, is much uh, faster than compared to the urban areas. In rural areas, poverty has declined by from almost 33% to, to about 19%. That's about 13 to 14% reduction. In urban areas, a reduction is from 8.5 to about 5.27%. Uh, some of the states like UP, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Odisha, and Rajasthan, of course, because they have high levels of poverty, so accordingly, they have also witnessed uh, the, the highest number of reduction in the number of people, number of poor people. And uh, so MPA value has also improved, and intensity of poverty has also improved from 47% to 44%. Okay. Uh, so they, these uh, maps essentially tries to uh, try to capture as to how India has been faring compared to the previous survey and the current survey and FHS four and FHS five. So as we can see, there are a lot of areas which were earlier yellows, orangeish, and now they are moving towards uh, light green, dark green, and the number of orangeish yellows are actually consistently declining. So this shows this improvement in improvement in poverty statistics across almost all the states in the country. There is no not even a single state which has actually recorded any any increase in poverty. So one very important feature of this uh, MPA is that because NFHS data is available at the district level, so we are able to calculate multidimensional poverty also at the district level. So so about 700 districts for which data is captured in NFHS. So we can see this again uh, just like the previous map. So uh, a lot of districts which were earlier in yellow, orange, now they move to green. So India can be seen as much more greener in the uh, chart on the right hand side compared to what is it is there in the left hand side. So this shows that essentially a very comprehensive decline in the deprivation across all the 12 parameters all across the country. Mm. Next. So I'm not sure whether the chart is clearly visible or not. So the report is already available on the website of Niti Ayog. If anybody is interested, I can share a hard copy as well. And in fact, today, as we speak, we are sending out, in fact, CEO's written, written letter to about 138 Indian missions abroad. He has written to every in each and every ambassador of India uh, personal letters he has signed, and we are sending to all heads of Indian missions abroad. Earlier, we have sent uh, copies of the report uh, by way of DO letters from the vice chairman to all the chief ministers in the country, and from by way of DO letters from CEO to all the chief secretaries. And we have been receiving a lot of uh, responses from that, and uh, everybody is appreciating this report. And uh, as you can see, this Bihar, Jharkhand, Meghalaya, Uttar Pradesh, and Madhya Pradesh. So they still have the highest poverty levels in the country. And uh, percentage decline is also pretty good in these uh, states, which I'll come to a little later. Or uh, on the contrary, states like uh, Kerala, Goa, Tamil Nadu, Sikkim, they have recorded the lowest multidimensional poverty in the country. Next. So uh, the, this slide essentially indicates how much percentage point reduction has been made in the multidimensional poverty. For instance, Bihar has reduced the poverty levels by 18%. Madhya Pradesh had a recorded decline of 15.9%, Uttar Pradesh 14.7%, Odisha 13.65%, and so on. 
So the lowest reduction is being recorded in the states of Tamil Nadu, Sikkim, and Punjab. Of course, because they also had uh, very low poverty levels also. So the reduction is also comparatively lower. But there is not even a single state where poverty level has gone up. Next. So, so, so this is a very important slide. So I would like to, I think, uh, delve a little deeper into this. So these are all the 12 indicators what we are talking about. The first bars, you can see this reflects nutrition. Second reflects child and adolescent mortality. Third is maternal health. Then we have years of schooling, then fifth school attendance, cooking fuel. So if I look at the first two bars, you can see uh, the deprivation in terms of nutrition. So it has come down from 37.6% to 31.5%. So green one is what is represented by NFHS 5. Yellow one is what is for NFHS 4. Uh, child is almost same as not much different, but maternal health 22.6 to 19.2% uh, is about 3.5% reduction. And uh, years of schooling now 11.4%, attendance is 5.3%. But some of the areas where a lot of uh, very significant impact has made, it can be seen in cooking fuel. So after this, Pradhan Mantri Ujula Yojana, where I think almost uh, I think more than 9 crore cooking gas connections have been uh, distributed all across the country, additional uh, connections. So we can say the deprivation has come down very sharply. So I think for almost 60% to about 40% now. And this was in 2019 to 21. And in fact, bulk of the survey had taken place in the, during the pre-COVID period. So even today, I, I'm sure this figure would have been even much better than after that. Similarly, in sanitation, after this Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, this uh, construction of toilets and the provision of houses. So it from 52% has come down to 30%. Drinking water again, Har uh, Ghar Nal Jal Yojana, it's come down from 10.9 to 7.3 percent. So, Bhagya Yojana, so the thrust of the government is to provide electricity connection to every household. So, here, deprived percentage of people has come down from as much as 12.2 percent to about only 3.3 percent. So, housing the reduction is about from 45.6 to 41.4 percent. Here, we are finding some issues. I think between the, I think only between this group. Uh, so, what we are facing is there is a difference in definition between the uh, Paka house and the Kacha house between what Mosque does and what uh, uh, NFHS does. So as per NFHS, the definition is much more stringent. They also look at the floor. That's why deprivation level is still 41%. Otherwise, as per Mosque data, I think this is, figure is much better. Similarly, for asset ownership, it has improved from 14 to 10.2%. And bank accounts, as you know, this Jandhan Yojana, I think about uh, more than 50 crore bank accounts have been opened under Jandhan Yojana. So as now, People who are not excluded, the banking pool has come down from 9.7% to 3.7%. So you can see across all these 12 indicators, there has been marked improvement uh, during this five year period. Next. So this slide essentially indicates the uh, uh, number of people who have escaped multidimensional poverty in different states. I think entire India, I said, as I said, 13.5 crore people have exited poverty. In Uttar Pradesh, the number is highest because the Uttar Pradesh, I think, uh, population is also very high. So about three and a half crore people have exit, escaped multinational poverty in UP, then followed by Bihar, 2.25 crore, Madhya Pradesh, 1.35 crore, and then all the way down to different. So in Lakshadweep, is a very small unit, it is the decline is neg negligible. But we can see as well, in every state, there has been quite a comprehensive uh, improvement. I think with this, I thank you for your patient hearing, and I'll be pleased to respond to any questions if anybody, anybody has. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, I think we'll move on to the discussions. I don't know, is uh, Dr. Pranab Sen here? Yeah. Or should we start? Sir Pranab, sir, Dr. Pranab Sen is here. Uh, don't see his, but if he's there, he can start. I don't know why you can't see me. <laughs> sir, we would like to see you, sir. I'm, I'm missing Can you, you so see much. me now? You were earlier in planning commission, sir. I miss you ah, so there much. There you are. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. So you've, you've located me. Yeah. That's yes, great. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, thanks, Dr. Suri. I mean, I, I actually read the report quite carefully. And I must come. Did you write it? Yeah, yeah. Of course, yes. The entire team of us. Congratulations. Uh, very well written. Um, and, you know, I must say, I, the uh, two additional indicators that the government has brought in, I think, are both very desirable because they're both pointers towards, uh, you know, improvement in the gender aspects. 
uh, maternal mortality certainly, but even the bank account thing, uh, increasing the number of bank accounts is not going to be that much for men as it would be women opening bank accounts. So, you know, I think those are two very valuable ad additions. And it's something we perhaps should argue in the international fora as well. But having said that, let me uh, make a few comments, perhaps which would help you in the future. The first comment is, I do not like the term multidimensional poverty index. All right. Um, I noticed, Dr. Suri, that when you are presenting, you didn't actually say poverty. What you did say was deprivation. And I would, I prefer to think of this as a multidimensional deprivation index. Um, poverty has a very, very specific connotation, uh, which we really should not uh, sort of violate. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, the language does matter. But that's that's a minor point. But I think it's it's something that uh, Niti Aayog should consider in terms of how we present it. The second point I'd like to make, and this is this is a much more serious, it's a much more technical point, is that the multidimensional poverty index or deprivation index has one very specific quality which we must take note of, which is that it is it has a very strong ratchet effect. It's very difficult to slip backwards on this index. Is practically impossible. Okay, so out here, the question that we should be asking is not so much about whether we are slipping back, because we will not find anybody slipping back. The question we should be asking is how fast are we improving? That is the appropriate question to ask. And if you actually, you know, anybody who's interested can go through the indicators that Dr. Suri has provided, and you'll find that once you have attained that index, you can't go backwards. If you've got your class eight degree, you've got your class eight degree for life, right? I mean, you can't become class six two years later. So, and this is true across most of the indicators. So there is a strong ratchet effect that you have to be careful about. And this, I think we should make clear so that when we report it, we should be reporting in terms of the pace of progress and the dimensions in which progress is being made. And I'm glad you brought it out. I think that came out very clearly in your presentation. The second point I'd like to make, and this is again something we should, we should think about, is that the index although we tend to talk about it as if it were at a personal level, at the individual level, it's actually a household measure, right? So if a child is not going to school in a household, the entire household is considered poor. Yes. Okay. Now this has an important implication. And there are two dimensions of this implication. The first is that as population growth slows down, as it has been doing for a long time in our country, the index will tend to improve whether we do anything or not. This is arithmetic. The second, which is even more important in the Indian context because the data bears it out, is that if you have a society which, in which families are breaking up, so joint families are breaking up into two or more nuclear families, what will end up happening is that the index will improve, simply, particularly the headcount, because what will happen is that one of the nuclear families that has come into creation will have all the, the problems that were identified earlier and the others will not. And this is 
this is a natural process. And in the, in the country, we know from our, our data that the rate of growth of households has been faster than the rate of growth of population, which means that as a society, as a community, we are nuclearizing. So there are two forces, both of which, one which is coming essentially from the demographics of the country, and the second, which is coming from the social structure of the country, which were both leading to improvements of the indicator, whether any other improvement has taken place or not. Right? And this will continue up to a point, and then we will reach the limits of both. After which, the progress that we will make will be entirely in terms of what the development is. So at the moment, we the index is capturing three factors. The principal factor is, of course, development. And then you have the uh, demographic factor, and then you have the social structure factor. So, so we have three factors which are working together to give us this very handsome improvement. But two of those factors are going to go away, and they're going to go away quite soon. And we shouldn't go into depression. That's the important part of it. Okay? With these words, I'll stop, and I thank you again, Dr. Suri, for an excellent report. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, over to you, Dr. Kundu. Audible and visible? Yes. Thank you. I must begin by congratulating and complimenting Niti Ayok for first bringing the baseline multidimensional poverty report and then the report latest one based on the data, NFHS data from 2019 to 2021 period. Although there was the highest level, there are some skepticism about the NFHS data. I'm very happy that Niti Ayok chose to use that information. And must compliment the Grove Foundation also for organizing this discussion on this very important theme. Now, first, Dr. Virmani, while giving the perspective evolution of this poverty index, but in a way giving the reasons why constructing multidimensional poverty index became important, some of the problems with the conventional poverty index based on consumption expenditure and or income one reason you mentioned is about difference between the consumption data from the national income accounts and the consumption survey well that is a you are right that the gap is increasing but there have been attempts there are many committees which have been set up to really resolve that issue and efforts are being made and in fact one uh, group believes that you can just upscale it the consumption expenditure data at the household level from the national level figures, others I mean, with Minhas said that commodity-wise adjustment should be made, but this is an issue which can be addressed. Similarly, you mentioned about reference period. This is a mixed, modified mixed reference period, which has been accepted as being valid. Even that is not the reason why the need for multidimensional poverty became important. Also, you've talked about the, the role of the public good. It's true that in the 50s, when you talk about poverty, or we started measuring it in the 60s formally, we did not think that health and education will be coming in the private budget. It will not be out of household expenditure. It will be public good in a way. But now there's a high expenditure on health and education from the household. So there you have to adjust the poverty line, as Bhalla has argued, that when during the pandemic period, gas was given, food was given free, so obviously you have to, that has to be counted for. That is part of the, you know, the, your household expenditure goes down because free goods are available. So certainly that is also an important adjustment which needs to be made. And I have a feeling there is a lot of skepticism which has come up about the multidimensional poverty index. And I must say it comes up not only from the outside the government, but also within the government. And I think this is an important to address those things. The basic reason why I think multidimensional poverty became very important. Right in the 60s, 
when we have started measuring poverty formally, the Planning Commission Committee, Dandekar Rath, they were basing poverty on deprivation, deprivation in calories, which was considered to be inadequate. Massive criticism came up of the conventional poverty index. It does not capture whole poverty. And poverty was defined largely in the context of various deprivations. Earlier, it was restricted to food, nutrition, but nonetheless, educational deprivation is not included in poverty. Health deprivation is not included, access to basic amenities. And there was a massive criticism and demand for expanding, particularly, I must say, from the civil society group saying that this poverty measure is not capturing the real poverty, which is understood in a large context of deprivation. If poverty is not deprivation, then it's an empty box. Basic problem came up that the indices based on the conventional measure showed poverty has gone down to 5% or a study making some stipulation projection of the consumption expenditure showed it has become zero. People said, look, there are manifestations of poverty in terms of infant mortality rate, in terms of nutrition, in terms of, you know, not having electricity. And you are saying people are dying on the road because they don't have access to basic, you know, health facilities. And he said, your poverty is zero. So people were very upset about this kind of a conventional measure of poverty, which has nothing to do with the outcome indicators. If you say, oh, people are dying, oh, that is because of mismanagement. If people are malnourished, oh, that's because consumption habits are not there. So basically, there was demand for linking up poverty with some outcome indicators. And I'm really very happy that the outcome indicators have been brought in in the measurement of multidimensional poverty. But the skepticism is also because there's a feeling that now the consumption expenditure poverty base will not be taken up. That I think is a very, very serious issue. If indeed multidimensional poverty has come up, and that means that we will not have consumption expenditure based poverty to be used in, you know, basically program implementation or monitoring. That's a very, very unfortunate thing. And I'm basing my comment, assuming that as soon as the data becomes available, I mean, after all, consumption expenditure data has not been available for various reasons, but I hope this is taken up. And we should be in a position to use the multidimensional poverty index as a strong instrument of intervention at the district level, because the data are much more robust. As Dr. Pranab Sen mentioned, that most of the indicators, the demographic index, excepting the nutrition indicator, which can vary, the others, once you have access to, you know, a school education, yes, the child will not drop out, even if the uh, earning has gone down. If the person has electricity or a gas, it is very unlikely that the person will slip back. That is perfectly understandable. And that is why we need both multidimensional poverty index as well as we need the consumption expenditure based uh, index. But I have few methodological issues that I want to share with you. You know, the point is, as Dr. Sen mentioned, it's a household based indicator, right? If a child is not going to the school, it is not the child which is deprived, but it reflects the household characteristics, the attitude perhaps of the, of the family members or the capability of the family members to send the child. So I think this is a very valid point. And in the Niti Aayog's report, it has been mentioned that why one person being malnourished in the relevant age group will really make the whole household as malnourished, I mean, as deprived. I think that approach of considering on the from indicator, although you are using indicator at the individual level, but you are identifying the household. Actually, how do you get the number of persons headcount ratio? You first find out the households which are deprived, and then you find out the number of persons in those households. So that's how you get the uh, deprivation index. But my submission to the person who have been responsible for writing the report, I think there is a confusion. Please look at 2.4 in the methodology section and 2.8 of the methodology section. 2.4 talks about individuals should be counted. If an individual is not going to school, that person is, you know, um, uh, 
you know, uh, deprived. And the person if is going to school in this age group, that person is not deprived. Sorry, if the two persons are in the same household, and if the, if one person is deprived, the whole household gets deprived. So that is something that that confusion was avoidable. But I understand. I looked at the report. I think this confusion has not been reflected in the methodology. But one serious issue has been raised in the literature, and Dr. Pranab Sen did mention about it, is censoring. Censoring means that if any household is deprived in any indicator. That household is not considered to be poor. Is that a valid proposition? People like John Reyes has said, if you have identified 12 indicators, any person reporting deprivation, any household is deprived, then that household should be considered deprived. Censoring means if the household has a score of poverty, which is more than 33%, then only it will be deprived. If there is a deprivation in one or two or three indicators, but overall deprivation is less than 33, maximum being one, then the household is not considered to be poor. If the score is less, that is the censoring method. Now, this is the point which can be raised that we have talked about malnutrition to be a very, very significant point. If a household is malnourished and deprived in the nourishment indicator, then I have a feeling people are would be arguing that look that house that cannot be compensated. So that's a debate. I personally do not agree with John Reyes's argument with Bhalla that uh, the censoring should not be done. You know, I think if a household is you know below a certain level in banking or in you know one of two facilities, then I have a feeling the other indicator should be able to compensate. But Niti should consider that. Should, should we make slight departure and saying that if a household is deprived in the nutrition indicator, it should be considered poor. And for others, we apply the censoring method. That is one suggestion which is emerging. I would also like to mention one more thing. You see, you mentioned, sir, that the methodology is exactly the same, which is adopted at the global report. By the way, global report came few months earlier than the Niti IO uh, using the same set of data for 2015-16 and 2019-21. So we were in a way delayed by uh, Niti IO was delayed by six months, but results are more or less the same. But the point is, if you examine each indicator, I was responsible for the multidimensional poverty report for West Asia. I was based in UNESCO. Beirut and we prepared that report. We found for every indicator, the exact data is not available. And I have checked up with all the 12 indicators. All two indicators are our own indicator. Other, other 10 indicators, the age group is slightly different. The coverage is slightly different. Let me tell you about nutrition indicator, which is the most critical indicator. In the global indicator, anyone who is deprived in the age group of zero to 75, if one person is deprived, the whole household gets deprived. Whereas in the Indian context, we have taken up to five years and then 15 to 55 and 15 to, uh, uh, you know, 50 for male and woman, where we have excluded above 55 and we have excluded five years to 15 years. That is not intentional. That Niti did not do it because it wanted to show deprivation to be less. Because NFHS data only gives that. Similarly, the data availability has forced us, Niti Ayok, to make certain changes, which is understandable. But nonetheless, given the importance that the Niti report gives to nutrition, attempts should be made to get the nutrition data for all age groups up to at least 75. That is extremely important because that is an indicator which, as I was suggesting, you know, we have made departures from the global report. We have made departures in se several indicators because of data availability or our priority. And that is not a big problem. We have had discussion with Sabina Alkire several times and she said many countries have made departures from that. But we should perhaps be able to pinpoint that one indicator which is extremely important, which can change from year to year if we have the data. 
as Dr. Sain mentioned, that other indicators would not change. We got more static demographic indicators related to housing condition and all that. This indicator can change. I think that that is something extremely important. One more point I want to mention, again, about the indicators. If one person is, let's say, nutritionally deprived, the whole household becomes nutritionally deprived, irrespective of the individual status. But what about those households where the relevant data cannot are not available? For example, a household which doesn't have a child, a household which, let's say, doesn't have any uh, pregnancy case in the last five years. Your, your health indicator is about, suppose there is no delivery. What happens? That household is considered to be non-poor. That is something which I have discussed in the global report also, that if certain indicators are not available or are not relevant for certain, for certain households, as I said, there is, for example, what kind of cooking gas do you use? So there are large number of migrants who don't cook. So they are not deprived because they don't use the, you know, uh, non-renewable energy. They are not using gas, but they are not using anything. They are not using coal also. So they are not deprived because they don't have energy. I have a feeling that the indicators, those households which are not having that information for some reason or that indicator is not relevable, they should be excluded. Otherwise, and if you do that, poverty level will go up to certain extent. Final point I want to mention that, you know, how do you ensure that multidimensional poverty is free from subjectivity? I have informally, we have heard Dr. Virmani on this. You know, there is a lot of subjectivity. Anybody can pick up any indicator of the global report or the Niti Aayog's report says, I'm giving a better indicator. I have read in the last three months time, at least seven, eight papers which say, this indicator should be replaced by that. It is very much possible to really disagree with one indicator and say, I want another indicator. Subjectivity is involved. And I remember Arrow's impossibility theorem. Arrow said individual ranking of 20 people cannot be really sorted out and give a collective ranking. So obviously ranking of 12 indicators cannot be combined without violating some basic economic theoretical principles. And that is what Arrow said. But Amartya Sen and Mahbubala Apili said that, look, you can't have that kind of purity if you want to be relevant in policy making. So I, I, I'm happy that economic planning has been rescued from that kind of a welfare economics framework. But then the basic question people would be asking that how do you ensure that a specific person who is in charge would not change certain indicators? Questions have been raised about banking, although it is sensitive to a uh, woman, only 3% of the people of the household are, are uh, you know, not having banking facilities. Whether they have any money in that or not doesn't matter. You don't have, if, if you have a bank account, you are non-deprived. And that if 97% people get a clean check from the banking indicator, obviously poverty level goes down. But I would agree that back. But other indicator about this uh, maternal welfare, the checking up of the woman, that's the new indicator which has been added. That's an extremely important indicator. 30% of the households are showing deprivation in that. So I cannot say that the two indicators have been added deliberately to reduce the poverty figure. One, banking is one thing which is, cannot be considered to be as important as availability of drinking water or electricity. That I would agree. And the weightage given to banking is same as the other assets. So people can question that. But I don't think there is any deliberate attempt to really bring down the poverty level by adding this indicator. But my final comment is that let us not throw the baby with the bath water. After a long discussion, we have been able to come to some kind of a framework. Happily, it comes from the global uh, report. And I have argued with many people for or against the indicators. But once that framework is there, please stay with that. And the success of our multidimensional poverty index in program implementation will depend on to what extent you can protect our index and the choice of indicators, sources of the data, the weightages from immediate political vested interest. And if you have an institutional structure to protect the indicators and the data sources so that they are not vulnerable, 
there is a change in the government you say no we don't want these indicators we want another set of indicators i know for arab property report we have to argue with the arab league countries to say how fgm this is female genital mutilation should be included and we have included in arab west asian poverty report also we have 12 indicators we have added two indicators we had to argue and argue and finally we agreed that yes female genital deprivation is an index of deprivation of for, for the woman and should be part of the uh, poverty calculation so i my only submission to niti ayog and also all concerned in the government is to ensure that there is a framework which has been accepted there are problems in that i'm not saying this is the most ideal set of indicators we can get but let us not destroy it let this continue at least for oh, let's for a decade for policy intervention we can do that at the district level you right you mentioned that district level indicators are possible but by the way only five or six districts show any decline uh, in case of delhi there is some decline in a very exceptional case the district will show a decline in the multi dimensional poverty Well, poverty index is calculated by number of people multiplied by intensity of poverty. That's another good point about this. So, with that final submission, that let us try to protect this uh, 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 the multi-dimensional indicator system from the immediate political vested interest, so that this acquires over time some robustness in terms of its application. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, uh, Dr. Suri. Would you like to? of course a lot of uh, technical comments which probably you would not like to address but if you want to comment on any of those any of the things yeah it's a word well, first of all thank you for those excellent comments i'm uh, very glad to see uh, dr pranav sir i think he was my previous boss so i'm sitting in the same room where he used to sit in planning commission um, sir one small request sir if you could just uh, uh, both the professor kundu and uh, professor Pr pranav sir if you can just small small bullet points and if you can just write those points which you have indicated out of or maybe if uh, charanjit can if you are recording this if you can send me a note on this i think we'll be very happy to take it uh, forward in the next report we'll try to do uh, to cover as many as possible sure. and one major advantage of uh, this index is of course because we also have the district level which is not there in the global report so uh, since we want to also see how the progress is go progress is there in the states and districts there this kind of report comes in very handy for us mm. so other the technical issues i will not like to respond now in the event i will be happy if they can send us some points so that I, we can improve upon the report next time thank you so much sir okay uh, uh, dr charan singh uh, dr vishen das would you like to uh, make any comments or raise any questions sir i would like to make yes sir yeah channel uh, ah yeah. carry I yeah i would like to make three points uh, one is a query and three are observation one dr suri you will have the recording by noon tomorrow second sabina elkere who is considered an authority on multi dimensional poverty globally is making a presentation at igro on november 12 november 10 uh, on exactly the same issue but she is taking the global uh, multi dimensional poverty indicators and talking to us i would actually invite if sir you could chair and professor kundu and professor pranav sain could also join as discussants that be really helpful and third point sir uh, lots of study uh, lots of uh, references have been given to poverty and uh, dr bhalla and uh, dr virmani and karan's paper uh, there is a follow up paper at the imf published in july 2023 inequality and poverty in india by arbatni and uh, matir they are making the presentation next week so maybe you would uh, if i could request uh, if you could join uh, it is the it is an extension in a way uh, of the conclusion which was done by bhalla virmani and karan's paper so these three are coming up in the line these were the three observations dr suri uh, because it's something new and it's happening and evolving my thoughts were uh, is there a mapping done where we could see that uh, this multi dimensional poverty or multi dimensional deprivation in a way uh, maps up district wise i know you have done an innovation but if it was state wise and uh, center nation as a whole if a mapping done with the with the previous indicators how would this uh, stand the test thank you 
okay uh, yeah uh, uh, dr vishendas uh, yes. yeah yeah yes sir uh, thank you very much uh, thanks the chair and i congratulate dr yogesh suri for making very excellent and extensive presentation and i i listened dr pranav sen he, he was very thorough and uh, dr kundu it was very uh, enjoyable and it was a masterful exposition two three things very basic doubts uh, dr yogesh suri uh, there are certain things for example free food and then free transport say for example in delhi a uh, certain category of women are they are given free transportation but in some cities not and how those data are comparable in terms of the poverty because there are many things for example in kisan uh, uh, kisan uh, they give 6000 rupees and do you have you have you accounted for that free kind of uh, uh, things to to many beneficiaries or the citizens uh, so those are the issue which really passes through my mind i i am worried how how do you compare across uh, the cross sectional poverty within the country that that, that is uh, my uh, okay. issue otherwise thank yeah thank you acha i actually uh, yeah before i take more questions i really uh, want to make a uh, come back to the broader issue uh, i think maybe some of you missed uh what dr uh, suri said that this whole thing as far as the government is concerned started with the sdg goals right uh is that that's what you said dr suri right so 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 the context for us is development right it's economic development now what is economic development uh, again i am not trying to i am not making technical point my job in it is not technical i'm trying to reach the audience so so what is development right so what is the government uh, try to do it tries to raise the per capita income of the country as a whole that is an aggregate goal of policy uh, rate of growth of per capita income uh, it is to provide public goods uh, we have a massive uh, highway program uh, which is not included in this item but that doesn't mean it's not important uh we provide infrastructure that is the point i made about quasi public goods uh quasi public goods is just a short hand term for infrastructure there is hard infrastructure uh, water electricity there is soft infrastructure health facilities educational facilities uh you know th that's not new right we've had public health uh, uh, uh primary health care secondary care for ages Uh, we have had primary uh, schools uh, so that was that is a development goal right uh, uh, so so that's some, not something new it, it's not uh, something uh, that you know it's it suddenly come out of the blue that is those are the <laughs> development goals we've had the issue is okay who's left out who is not got it how quickly we are doing it and i agree i, I don't know if uh, Uh, Pranav has left, but I think that it was a valid point he made uh, about speed. Part of that is valid. So, so, so the issue is uh, not uh, whether. And the second, sorry, the point about outcomes, which is something again we we have been doing a lot. Uh, Dr. Suri has been uh, directly involved for the last ten, fifteen years. I've been out of it, uh, uh, but but the whole idea is okay. we we don't just want to say how much electricity is produced has it actually reached those people so in that sense it relates what you are doing is you are trying to relate outcomes uh, by some indices with the development goals it's not so in that sense i think uh, pranav had a, a good point that that the issue is not uh, poverty per se uh, some of these are deprivation you could say everything is deprivation if if there is no market if the electricity doesn't reach there is no market for electricity there so the question of uh, giving money to somebody doesn't arise na so you can look at it as deprivation so what i am saying is uh, for the common person i don't want to get into definitional things and uh, of course all these technical points are important for you to uh, when you uh, see how to measure what data to get etc 
but as far as the common person is concerned it's a question of relating development goals with development outcomes and to see whether everybody gets it i, I just want to make that broad point that was the perspective from which i was coming that doesn't mean that this particular index is not important or this thing that, that I, I was not getting into that at all. But, but this development perspective should not be forgotten when we start uh, getting into the, the narrower stuff. Okay, let me open up. I saw a couple of hands uh, uh, somewhere. Are you there? Some gentleman was here. I, I didn't know his name. Yes, I think you were there. Uh, Mr. Uh, Math Matthew, you wanted Mr. Korean? Dr. Kurian, you wanted to ask somebody uh, had raised a hand. I don't know. Uh, uh, yes. Unmute. Yeah, please. Go uh, ahead. First of all, I congratulate uh, uh, for taking this very pertinent uh, topic for this webinar. Uh, my first question is, uh, I follow Amritya Sen's uh, definition of, of poverty and uh, in, uh, in that, uh, we have the economic factor, the health, uh, the education, all these. But one factor is so participation. And uh, in, uh, casually, there was a reference to Kerala uh, as one of the topmost in uh, I think this is a very factor of Kerala society, the social participation. Everybody can equally participate in the Grama Sapa. There will be no caste divisions or like that. So my query is, uh, in your uh, poverty uh, uh, okay. do you include this capability, this sort of capability deprivation? That is my okay. query. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Any other question? Uh, the, uh, hand here. Uh, I think Mr. Singh, we can't hear you. Mr. Singh? SN Singh, unmute, unmute. Hello, there's a Mr. Singh, I cannot hear him. I think you're muted, I, I can't hear him. Mr. SN Singh, he, he's got his hand up, but I can't hear him. Mr. Essencing, if you could write your question in the chat box because we can't hear you. Oh, here he has got it. Yeah, there is a need to restructure. He had already written the question. Yeah, definition of poverty and development as per current Indian index. Charan, do you understand what the question is? I'm. Yeah. Well, what I understand is this need to restructure. That's fine, but. As per current Indian index, I do not know what current Indian index he has in mind. Okay, uh, Dr. Suri, do you want to take up any of the last two, three questions or any comment you want to make? There have been actually numerous questions. Yeah. Okay, why don't you read it out, Charan, uh, Dr. Singh? Charan? Yeah. Um, see, there is one question by SN Singh where he says there is need to measure temporal poverty and permanent poverty. And then, uh, uh, so there is a little talk amongst the uh, people there. And then, of course, he's talking about the poverty index. So that's probably one thing he has in mind. And they refer to HDI included 3, it has 12. Uh, definitely, it is a better indicator. So, I think there's a talk going on between SN Singh and others. Okay. And then um, the other thing he's saying is poverty must be measured at individual level. So, that is the other thing which he's mentioning. But I think it's a question. Sir, uh, sir. By Mr. Sachin, who says, How do we look at indicators like child mortality? I presume these are available only for population groups and not for households. So, and there's another question uh, by Ramesh Kumar, where he's referring about 111th rank in out of 125 countries in GHI. So that's the question uh, questions that are going on in the chat box. Okay, uh, Dr. Suri, you want to take up anything? You don't have to answer all of them, but general point, if you want to take up something. 
Sir, Chairman, sir, I see. My, uh, sir, sir, Chairman, please. Sir, I only see. one, only one, one minute, please. Uh, also wants to say something. Okay, yes, sir. Mr. Singh, yeah. Yeah, sir, please. My, uh... Oh, hanging. Hey, he's gone again. <laughs> it's gone. Uh, is there something wrong with his system? Hello, uh, Dr. Suri, you want to say something? I can't. It's gone. It's also it, gone. Dr. Pradesh wanted to say something. I think let him finish. Yeah, I just, okay. I just wanted uh, to check, um, you know, at the moment, the definition of poverty that we used was <clears throat> what we had done during the socioeconomic and caste census. You remember that? Wait, so which poverty? The you talking about the consumption the poverty? Or? Huh? No, 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 no. The SECC was a multidimensional poverty type measure. Ah, okay. That Dr. Suri may know. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. So this was done in 2012, the SECC, the socioeconomic and caste census. And then that data, which is not exactly the same as the uh, multidimensional index that you're using, uh, but it, it is similar. It is multidimensional. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, you know, it would be, so that is the definition of poverty we are using today. So people who have the uh, BPL cards come from that uh, exercise. Yeah, and for the BPL purposes, much, yes. Yes, for beneficiary purposes. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah, uh, it would be very useful if you can give a concordance between the SECC measures and the measures that you're using in the multidimensional poverty index. That's a suggestion. Dr. Suri can consider for his next yeah. Yeah, okay, I'm thank you. yeah. yeah. it would just, just help us to right, right. understand whether or not our current definition of who is poor yeah. Yeah. is a broad point. Broad, yeah, I agree with your broad good suggestion. That at least I should I should also think about uh, the issue uh, which you have raised. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Suri. This is this is uh, uh, I I would like to add something here because in the rural area, if you go to the, really in the uh, ground level, you will find there are many rich people. They are having the uh, BPL. They are having the below poverty line card to avail the facilities. Then how to remove that? This is the common practice in rural area. Okay. So should I come in? Yes. Now we can hear you. So if you, do you want to ask your question and please ask it now because it's been so difficult. That's it. So okay. You have, Thank you. Yeah, I think there is a need to consider some aspect of corrections. Then only we can go for the government data because government data is not accurate, not you know that the up to the mark. This is my and, sense. And, uh, okay, fine. Yeah, of, what's yes. your question? Okay. Uh, so, Suri, respond, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Dr. Virmani, can I? No, please. Make, uh, uh, he's going to respond first. Uh, should I? Uh, after Dr. Suri has said, maybe yeah, yeah. Uh, they have asked him to speak. Let Dr. Definitely. Suri speak. Then yeah. I, I have one or two small comments. Yes. Sure, sure. Okay, yeah, thank you all for very, very useful comments. Uh, sir, as uh, uh, Dr. Sain has pointed out, I said, you will recall, sir, in planning commission, so there were two kinds of uh, So, what we're looking at their exercise. The exercise which was done by Ministry of Rural Development was socio-economic caste census. That was to identify who's poor. And the exercise done by Planning Commission was to identify or to ascertain the number of poor. So ascertaining number of poor and identify who's poor to who's poor, ideally they should both match. But in practice, it doesn't happen. So this socio-economic caste census was, was actually to whom we should give the benefit. Then based on caste census, then we then for if some of the schemes are different for the housing scheme. They may use the data of the people, actual specific households who do not have access to housing. For some other scheme, maybe we'll identify people. So that is how SEC was used. But this exercise of planning commission was to ascertain what is the uh, poverty and numbers at the national level, at the state level, at the rural, at the urban level. So that was more of a theoretical exercise. SEC was very useful, but and was, as you rightly said, MPA is almost fine doing the similar exercise, finding out who yeah, all are no, the, the reason I raise it, Dr. Suri is because the SECC is now dated. Yes, sir. Yes, it's sir. already 13 years old, sir. Mm -hmm. right? We are going to have to do something similar again once more. Yes, sir. To yes, another sir. SECC type exercise. 
Certainly, then, certainly, sir. That is then really. the question is, what would be the appropriate indicators to use then? Hmm. And yeah, yeah, I, I got it. Uh, uh, Pranav, yeah, we have to move on. Uh, yeah, I got your point very well. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Kundu? Uh, I think Dr. Sain made a very important point that this is not the first time in India that we are measuring multidimensional deprivation or maltreatment backwardness or multidimensional poverty. At the regional level, at the district level, state level, we have been doing it for the last 40 years. You know, the regional plans have been working out indicators of backwardness or deprivation and calculating. At the household level also, as Dr. Sain mentioned, the socioeconomic caste census data did collect the information, but there is a significant difference. One is that the methodology for identifying the households which are to be targeted for certain programs, because that was the whole purpose. It was announced before the ACCC census that the purpose is to identify the households which are deprived in different areas and the data was collected through a group discussion because people they had to certify, yes, the information is right. Whereas NFHS data is not collected with some kind of a peer group support. You know, you. Here, socioeconomic caste census data was, has to be somehow certified because this will be used at the household level for giving their benefits. As far as I understand, I have been uh, uh, talking to people in the NFHS, you cannot get individual identification from that. And as a result of the fact that ACCC data was announced to be used for benefits being diverted, Surjit has analyzed, I have analyzed to show that the information was biased. People mm -hmm. deliberately overstated their deprivation, not only their land holdings and other things, they even overstated their illiteracy because they wanted to put all that data in, in at par. So the overall deprivation reflected in the socioeconomic caste census data is very much higher than the NSS data, which was again collected during 2012-13. If you compare that, you find that ACCC CAS data is certainly biased. But I really like, uh, Dr. Virmani, your suggestion that multidimensional poverty, I mean, whether you call it poverty or deprivation, it really doesn't matter. I mean, if uh, I can understand somebody thinks that poverty means something to do with income, expenditure, health and education are deprivations. I can understand that. But there are people who have been saying, well, even the psychological dimensions of poverty should be, congestion factors should be brought in, violence should be brought in, in measuring poverty at the district level. But that is a, a small point. I mean, you can uh, disagree on the term. But nonetheless, there are two different approaches. The question, Vishandaji, you asked, what about the money which is being given to the households? What about the free ration which are being to the, given to the household? These will be part of your monetary calculation, income and consumption expenditure. That 1,000 rupees which is given to the household or 6,000 rupees per year, whatever is the amount, that would be added to the earning of the household and you can calculate that. As far as multidimensional poverty is concerned, it doesn't look at the input data. How much money you are getting, how much consumption expenditure. No, that should be reflected in your nutritional level that should be reflected in your access to electricity access to you know uh, toilet facility drinking water so basically the whole approach is that since the outcome indicators did not show much correlation and tendulkar committee itself said that the outcome indicators are not really correlated strongly with the poverty indicators so that was the reason why outcome indicators have been specifically brought in and i think both the you know, uh, calculation should go on simultaneously, but we should be in a position to design an institutional mechanism which can safeguard this framework from short term political interventions. That is my only concern. But there are three or four methodological issues that I've raised. I will share with Dr. Suri because how do you bring in censoring? Is censoring really, you know, uh, leaving out some of the critical indicators, some households okay, for which yeah. the indicator are not relevant. Yeah, yeah, sure. How do you uh, treat them? You know, I, I'm you. saying yeah. these are the indi information I've already written. I yeah. will pass on that paper to you because these are technical issues we can address. But my final again submission is let us not throw the baby with the bath water. This right. indicator should be used by the Niti, Niti IO in its right, policy. Right. Now, all, all that you said before is noted. Let's not kind of... Uh, no, uh, no, I just thought I should re-emphasize. Bless you, forget yeah, yeah, yeah. Virwanisa. Re we have talked about it even with you personally. Time. That's fine, fine. Yeah. Um, uh, 
uh, Charan, I, I would like to conclude as soon as possible. Is there any uh, outstanding question here? Yeah. Uh, Charan? Sir, I don't have a question. I am ready to conclude. Yeah, okay. You will then conclude, sir. Uh, uh, right. So, uh, as uh, Dr. Suri himself has said that he, you know, he'd love to have all your points on, on paper or email or whatever. Uh, and and he'll be happy to uh, consider them and, and incorporate whatever uh, can be incorporated in his uh, analysis for future, etc. Uh, uh, and as I said, Pranab, I think uh, where, where it's useful is that if they are going to do another uh, census to identify, certainly some of these results can be thought of and seen whether they can be integrated. But if you remember, I think the idea of that uh, now that I think back on it, though I wasn't here in 2012, uh, was to have identifiable indicators which can be visible, right? So you can see an asset or, you know, it, 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 things which could be physically seen by the eye uh, because you have to identify the exact person and household. But anyway, that's a whole another discussion, uh, uh, which uh, I think you rightly brought to the attention of Dr. Suri, who would be the person to take it up. Okay, thank you all. Thank you for the uh, people who are uh, participating and listening uh, and those who ask questions. So with that, I conclude the session and hand it back to Charan. So thank you very much for sharing it and adding so much of value to it. I want to thank uh, Dr. Sui for uh, sharing his research and the report with us. And I also want to thank Pradab Sain. I knew there was a challenge at his home today and he kindly agreed to join us and Professor Kundu, who actually motivated me and said, this is a burning issue, Charan, we need a discussion on this. And that is how the whole thing got organized. I would like to uh, thank the participants as well. And I would like to invite all of you next week uh, to discuss the paper on inequality and poverty in India by our buddy and uh, Matt here from IMF. And on November 10, when Sabina is presenting our research on the global multidimensional indicator, multidimensional poverty indicators. One last announcement, sir. Uh, as we all know about financial inclusion, EGRO Foundation is starting a campaign on. Uh, we are saying financial literacy. We are saying economic literacy. So we are trying to spread economic literacy across the country, nook and corner, and senior economists from RBI, SEBI, and professors from JNU, Delhi University have joined us. Every evening, 7.30 to 8.30 p.m., we do an online teaching course, and every day, in a regular pattern, we are taking up issues of macroeconomics. We take up monetary policy, fiscal policy, we take up even the real sector, financial sector, external sector. I want to request you, you and your students, wherever you are, if you can spread the word, look up the website of Figro and please take the benefit of these people who are like me retired and want to give back to the society, sharing their experience, making economics really interesting, and we are trying to spread economic literacy. With that, sir, I want to thank each one of you, and I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, sir. Uh, I know you're so busy as member, Titi. You kindly agreed to come and chair this session for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sir.